Hey, Brad, how are you? It's been, boy, almost two years since we did this last. I know. It has. It doesn't seem like that, but uh, a lot has changed since then. A lot, a lot of great things have happened. You've written a book, yeah. another book, actually, that's coming out. So, yeah, lots of fun stuff going on. Well, yeah, no, a lot of great things, but uh, I guess what we want to talk about today is your book. You've written a book as well since we last talked, and it's uh, The Catalyst Leader. And, you know, it was a great book. I mean, it, it actually chronicles, you know, what you've done in your organization and how you lead and what's worked and not worked for you. And, you know, it was great. It was transparent. It was authentic. It was a really fun read. But what what caused you to write the book? What inspired that, Brad? Well, uh, you know, I've, I just turned 40 last year and, um, a lot of my, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I still consider myself to be a young leader, but I realized at this point in my life that especially for the generation that I really want to serve, which is the 20 and 30 somethings that I'm, I needed to pass on some wisdom that I had learned and that catalyst, our organization had learned over the last 14 years of doing events and conferences and being around other leaders. And ultimately I just, I want my peers and I want the leaders coming up behind me to, to lead well and lead now. And that I, whole idea of lead well, lead now really resonated with me. And that's kind of where the book started was this idea that we've got a lot of young leaders today who are leading now yeah. because they have to, they're, they're being pushed into roles before they're many of them before they're ready. But I really want them to lead well, you know, and that idea that if you lead well now, then you'll finish well later. And, that we need a new generation, not that we didn't have one before, but I think it's really important that we start to equip younger leaders. And so I just want to, I want to be part of that story of coming alongside lots of people that I respect to be able to provide, you know, some wisdom and a few of the things I've learned. I'm still young. I don't, I don't have it all figured out, but um, just felt like it was time for me to put some of those things on paper. Well, I'm old and I don't have it all figured out, so we have that in common. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's, let's talk just a little bit about Catalyst. You know, for, for those viewers that aren't familiar with it, you know, it, it really is kind of the most influential leadership event, but it's really beyond an event. It's, it's more like a leadership movement. But, you know, talk, talk to me about Catalyst um, just so that we can put the book in context. Yeah. Well, we've been doing leadership conferences for – the last 14 years since 2000 and we came out of John Maxwell uh, John was was our founder uh, there was several people involved but John was really the founder and John basically said hey I'm at that time he was in his early 50s and he said I want to hand off so much of what I've been given to the next generation of, of the 20 somethings on my team at that time and so there was a bunch of us that said hey we'll run with that and we really started cattle with that with that idea that we wanted to gather our peers and younger leaders, um, uh, primarily under 40, and get them together and create an experience around that. And we didn't, we had, you know, I would love to say we had this grand vision that, you know, we would 15 years later be where we are, but we just thought, let's just get our friends together. I mean, that's really kind of where it started. And since then has, has grown, and we've been really intentional about making sure that we stay true to, to gathering leaders and then out of that, we started trying to create a little bit more of a movement and a little bit more of a community and a little bit more of, of connections with people throughout the year. Uh, but the, the conference idea is still very much the center of who we are, what we do. And um, the, the other thing is that we love the idea of content. We love equipping leaders, but we felt like we wanted to create an experience with Catalyst that truly was an experience. So if you come to a Catalyst conference, there's the sense that you walk away and you got great content, but you also had some experiential moments. You know, you had some times with music or with talent or with performers or with your team where you thought, well, I didn't expect that. You know, that was the unexpected. Um, we just, you know, we, we were going, we were part of lots of conferences and going to lots of conferences that were pretty boring at the end of the day. And um, Catalyst is not boring. That's one thing that we're definitely not. We're not boring. So, so we try so to, to give people an idea, you know, when somebody talks about a conference or an event, they might think of 500 people in a room at a hotel or, you know, a big conference of two or 3,000 people. I mean, why don't you describe how big this movement has actually become? Well, we, our event, we actually have an event coming up next week in Atlanta, the first week of October, 
and there'll be 12,000, 13,000 liters there in Gwinnett Arena. Uh, so that, you know, we kind of fill up an arena and yep. um, take over that environment for several days. And then we do some other events around the country that are anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 on the West Coast and in Dallas. We do some regional events that are smaller, just one day that are um, anywhere from 1,500 to 2,500 liters in attendance. So, you know, we'll usually impact in a year um, 30,000 or so leaders in person. And then we actually have another event that we do that's under a different name called LeaderCast. And a lot of folks are probably familiar with that because it's a simulcast event. And right. that, that event is broadcast by satellite to, you know, anywhere from 120 to 150,000 leaders who are in attendance at different locations around the U.S. So our organization uh, this year will will be in front of, literally live in person in front of, or at locations, you know, 180, 185,000 liters. So uh, that's we're, amazing. We're yeah, we're we're one of the big fish, definitely in yep. a small pond in terms of the amount of liters we're gathering, and um, and then we have a, you know a lot of folks beyond that that are part of our our email list and they're part of podcasts and they're part of yep. you know our blogs and that kind of stuff. So you, you go attend a Catalyst event, you have a great time, you have a lot of fun, you, you have great content, good experience. What, what happens when they leave? Well, you know, that's a great question. And we wrestled with that for a long time of, is that really our responsibility? And we believe it is, but we also believe that if a leader is attending an event like ours, that they're mature enough as a leader to take what they've heard and what they've learned and go put it into practice. And we felt a lot for a long time, like that was our job was to help them to go put it yep. into practice. And we try to, but we, we've basically said, you know what, our job is to inspire and gather and then release. And if we do that well, then these leaders who are, who are in attendance will take what they've learned and they'll put it into practice. And so we try to provide them things throughout the year, but we really, Again, you know, there, there's so many organizations that they start out with one vision and one idea of what can you be the best in the world at? And then they start getting tracked and booted and start trying to be all things to all people. And we just said from the beginning, we're going to be great at doing conferences and we're going to be yeah. the best in the world at creating world class leadership experiences in person for a leader to attend. And um, so we, we try to stay really true to that. And we have a lot of other partners we come alongside of and try to provide the connections and counseling and coaching and consulting and all those things. But we try to stay really focused on that one thing. Yeah. So, you know, the, the book is obviously something that extends beyond the event. Yeah. So, you know, in, in your book, you talk about eight different areas that leaders really need to embrace and kind of wrap themselves around. Why, why don't you kind of highlight those for me? Yeah, and uh, eight essentials, what I would say eight essentials for becoming a change maker. And we use that term change maker really uh, not to replace the word leader or leadership, but especially for a younger leader. It feels like change maker is a little bit more in line with kind of where people are going. Um, but the eight essentials are authenticity, um, calling, um, passion, principled, capable collaborative, and oh my gosh, I'm forgetting them now. I should know these. These are my eight. Uh, <laughs> I'll think I'm here to put you on the spot with the list. Hey, let, let's lock on to the second one that you mentioned, I think was calling. Yeah. yeah. You know, I've, I've often said leadership is more than a job. I mean, it, it's not just a role that you play. You know, it really is a calling because leadership done right is a 24-7, 365 kind of thing. You can't just part-time leadership. So talk to me about calling. How, how does a leader really understand that they're called to leadership? Well, I, yeah, I, I would say this. I think we're all called to leadership because we're all people who influence, you know, and, and that's, I'm stealing that from John Maxwell in the sense that he says that leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. So if you're influencing anyone, which would be all of us, we're all influencing someone, then you're a leader. You know, and so the, the calling of leadership is, I believe, put on all of us. Now, the levels to which you're leading, the, the, the stewardship of which you're leading is at different, you know, different points in your life. And, and usually as you get older, you have more responsibility, more stewardship. But I, that's where I would start is that I think we're all called to be leaders. When I think of calling, I, I mean, even the idea of 
that you've been purposed for something. And yep. the, the, the intersection of where your greatest strengths and your greatest passions come together, I think that's where you find your calling. You know, and so the example I love to talk about is so many of us, when we grow up, you know, we have these grand aspirations of we're going to be a professional football player or we're going to be a professional musician or whatever the case is. And that's a lot of passion, but not a lot of strength for most of us, you know. And so we end up usually moving towards those places, hopefully, where greatest strengths and greatest passions come together. So, like, for me, I'm my greatest strengths are strategy and and influence and leadership and running something. My passions are leadership and the next generation. And so, yeah. you know, for me, Catalyst is like that, that place where those things come together. So that's how I would describe calling. We hear lots of people try to define it. You know, it's your purpose in life. We've seen lots of books about it. But I think that's the simplest equation that I've found that's been really helpful. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a great explanation. You know, I, I think so many leaders just get stuck in the moment and, and they don't have that higher purpose or higher calling. And, and really, that's the essence of leadership. I mean, leadership isn't about the leader. It's about those the leader serves. And that's a theme that runs through your book is service. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, and I, I think of that comes, too, with this idea that, that the, the name of the game today for leaders is not only collaboration, but it's generosity and it's sharing. Mm -hmm. And it's this idea that, that you know, and, and even if you look at social media, the best way to gain influence in the social media space and in the digital space is, space is to serve others, to, like, be willing to help others and be willing to leverage your platform for the betterment betterment of others. And I think business and, and so, sort of the idea of the marketplace has always understood that in, in terms of, you know, if you help someone else, then typically the, you know, the higher tide lists all boats when it comes to sharing and generosity. And so I, I think that's in, I think it's vogue today. I think the idea yeah. of us saying we're going to be about others, like service, that's what service is at its core is being about others. I think if some, if a leader says, I'm not going to just be about others because I need something in return, but I'm going to be about others because I just believe that's the right thing to do. Then, yep. you know, that, that authenticity is also really important. And we can see a fake. We can see somebody who has an agenda a mile away, especially today. Like, you know, there's, you can't hide anymore behind these facades and you'll get found out pretty quick. So authenticity yep. in the midst of generosity and collaboration with the goal towards helping others, that that's what I believe like true service is. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Hey, you know, you, you've mentioned authenticity a couple of times. And one of the things that's, I think, really unique about your book is, is that you are very authentic and transparent. And as you read the book, you see some mistakes that you admit to and some things that, you know, had had you had the ability to go back and do them differently, you might well have. So So talk to me about you know, some of the mistakes that you've made and that leaders make and how they can kind of navigate that a little bit better. Well, I mean, gosh, I, we don't have enough time to, for me to talk about my mistakes um, because there's so many of them. And I think, I think part of being authentic as a leader is being willing to, to admit that and not only admit your mistakes, but also to be real with your team and uh, admit the things that you're not good at because they know. They know way before you know, and they know all the mistakes you've made. And if you're not willing to even just sort of acknowledge it and say, hey, guys, I realize that I, I goofed up and I, you know, I'm sorry, um, that, that gives you so much permission to, yeah. to speak into people. But, you know, for me, like one of the big mistakes, I, I talk about this in the book, is um, uh, last summer I was – I'm a pretty intense guy, so uh, – and I'm kind of an old school guy when it comes to, like, being on time. I just really yep. think it's important, and I tell my team all the time, if you're on time, you're late. If you're early, you're on time. So be early. You know, don't just be on time. And it was one morning in the summer, and nobody was here. It was 9 o'clock, and I just felt like that everybody had abandoned me. And I think all of us leaders have been there. And so I sent out this scathing email, <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I didn't go through the filter system. I didn't let other people read it. I just, like, in the moment, typed up this thing and sent it out. Well, I thought it was just this great piece of writing. I mean, I was really proud of it. 
And my team was like two or three people were crying. There were several interns that literally wanted to quit that day. Several people walked in and said, you know what, you send, this, you send one more of those and I'm out. And I realized pretty quick that, okay, the, I, felt, I felt like I said the right things, but I said them in the wrong way. You know what I mean? Like, I felt like things I was saying were free and correct and, hey, we need to be on time, but I was saying them in the wrong way. And so the lesson I learned was the right things said in the wrong way are still the wrong thing. Like, you can't take something that has a positive uh, feel to it and, a, and a, hopefully a good outcome and wrap it in intensity and frustration. And um, so that was a big lesson for me was just looking back and going, well, that was dumb. You know, I gotta, yeah. I gotta be willing to stop and let that email set in the drafts for an hour or two and then come back yep. and realize that I don't need to send that, you know? So that's one example. Yeah. So, so of, of the eight principles that you outline in your book, what, what do you think is the one that's most challenging for a young leader? What, what's the, what's the biggest hurdle that they really need to overcome? Well, one of the, one of the essentials is the idea of being capable and what that is, is it's excellence. And it's yep. about the idea that you can be great at what you do. And also the idea that, you know, it's about hustle. Like it's about hard work. It's about being great in perfection, but it's also that it takes a lot of work. And if you talk to older leaders, those who are seasoned, you know, most of them will say, the reason I have a platform now and I have influence and I have success is because I work my butt off. And I, I think that's one of the things that I would, definitely challenge 20 somethings with is you know you got to work for it like you you can't just feel that it's not only entitlement but it's also that if i just kind of show up great things will happen and so i think that's okay. a big warning sign for um for the next generation and um and I, you know we, we we hear all the time about how the next generation is lazy i don't i don't believe that i think i don't i think part of it is our fault like we've maybe established that and all of a sudden a lot of young leaders are walking in and there's there's sort of a, a, a pretense that, well, they're just entitled and they want everything on a golden spoon. And I think it's our responsibility to make sure they work hard. And, um, and also this idea that the 20 somethings feel like, Mike, that they have to accomplish great things and they have to like change the world by the time they're 30. And we mm -hmm. got to give, we got to give a time for the process to happen. You know, used to, it took 20 or 30 years to build a company and, um, and the same thing with building a leader. So we, we got to take some of the pressure off that if you're 28 and you haven't, you know, you haven't taken a company to an IPO or you haven't created the next great social innovation company that you failed. And, and that's, that's something I, I really want to help make sure 20 somethings realize is that's not, the idea of success. Success is yeah. a faithfulness over the over the long haul. Yeah, I think that's a great point because even if you experience success early, that doesn't mean that you'll be able to sustain it. And, and there's a difference between success and significance. And I think that's that's something that young leaders could really lock on to. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, one one of the things that's interesting, I you know, most of most of the people that I work with tend to be my age or even older. And, you know, I ask them, you know, I'll, I'll sit down with a 60 or 65 year old and I'll say, how much better of a leader are you today than you were just even 10 years ago? And the response is always the same. It's like, well, it's not even close. It's night and day. So I think to your point, really embracing learning and, and maturation and development and, and just hard work. It's, it's, it's important no matter what your age is. Yeah. Well, and that's, again, going back to what we said earlier, that's, that's a big reason why I felt like that writing this book, especially the audience I wrote it for, which are primarily younger leaders, you know, a 60 year old, I think can still read this book and find lots of wisdom in it. But I want these young leaders to feel like that what they're doing now really does matter. And part of the process has to be that you've got to be really committed to making sure that you're leading well now. And yeah. that's going to set you up for success. And I had, a, I had a mentor when I was in my 20s that would always tell me, he would say, your 20s, Brad, your 20s establish your 70s. Like, 
who you are in your 20s is the foundation for who you will become when you're 70. And so many times we kind of get to later in life and we start to work on legacy then versus being in our 20s and thinking, all right, I'm setting myself up for who I'm going to become later in life. And, you know, that's something I think, again, that that just that process of going 50 year run, like I got a 50 year run to to do this as well. Um, it takes some pressure, but it also makes sure that you see the process as more important necessarily in even the destination or the beginning. So, yeah. Well, I'm I'm just really thrilled that you wrote the book because, you know, I I catch leaders a little bit deeper in their life cycle, but I can tell you that almost to the one, I I don't know anybody that I work with that wouldn't have loved to have had your book when they were just starting out. You know, I I think you can really help people with the wisdom that you breathed into those pages. So I just, you know, it's it's a great read. It's a great book. If somebody wants to get in contact with you or find the book, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, uh, the website for the book is catalystleader.com. So they can go there. It's got like sample chapters to read and it's got all the information. And then any of the outlets like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or any, any of those places, um, you can find the book. And then if you want to get in touch with me, um, my blog is bradominic.com. So my name, com. And then if you want to email me from there, you just hit on the contact and it sends me an email directly. So love to talk to anybody or if you have questions or if you think, hey, what you're saying is is uh, is is resonating with me, but I got some questions or you don't even like what I'm saying, feel free to um, interact because I, I love this idea that, you know, social media and technology has given us the opportunity to help each other learn and to spur each other on. So would love to stay in touch with anybody. Uh, that's great. Hey, let me ask you to do one thing before we sign off. And that's Leave a challenge for the young leader. If you, if you were going to set the Chenning Bar high for somebody and challenge them, give them a, a piece of advice or some directional wisdom, what, what would that be? Well, the biggest thing I would say is whatever you're doing today, and it doesn't matter if you're starting an organization, if you're, uh, if you're in the middle of middle management or management, or if you're an intern, or if you're working at Starbucks as a barista, like, Whatever you're doing today, be great at it and see what you're doing today as this assignment, which is so important that if you don't do it better than anybody else in the world, that you failed. And just that idea that what I'm doing right now really matters and the future is the future and you want to prepare for what's next, but be present, like be in the now and see what your role is, whatever you're doing and whatever you've been called to do in sort of this stage of life, see it as, as something that you can be the best in the world at. So that would be my challenge. Uh, that's great. That, that, that's going to help a lot of people. So, hey, you know, for everybody watching this interview, I, I would strongly suggest that you go out and you buy Brad's book, you read his blog, you check out Catalyst, because it, it's a phenomenal opportunity for a younger leader. So, hey, Brad, let's not wait two years before we do this again. 